Today we're going to look at coming to grips with the real you. And before we do that, we have a short video that I'd love for you to see. It is really short. I want to be a scientist and a basketball player. I want to be a doctor. I want to be an artist and an art teacher. I want to be a nurse. A race car driver. When I grow up, I want to be a teacher when I grow up. How about you? What did you want to be when you were a little kid and you thought about what it'd be like to be all grown up? As for me, when I was six years old, I wanted to grow up and be a professional football player and play for the Oakland Raiders. That's how old I am back then. Um, I used to play with the boys up until I was in fourth grade. When I got to fourth grade, I had a rude awakening because I stopped growing and all the I stopped growing but all the boys kept growing I pretty much topped out at my height right now in fourth grade um, and I could still play with them but I couldn't keep up with them and when they caught up with me they would just crush me and so I had to come to the realization that I would not be a professional football player. I had to take an assessment of my strengths, who I was, and I had to face the reality. Have you ever had a time when you had to come to grips with who you are, with the real you? Today we're continuing our series in true spirituality. And we're learning that true spirituality is not a long list of do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. Instead, true spirituality is how we live our lives in relationships. The, one of the weeks we learn that our relationship to God is important. And with him, we want to live a relationship of surrender. Your face is so tiny. <laughs> Thank you, Bane. <laughs> okay. Your ears are so small. <laughs> They're so tiny. Okay, let's see if that does anything. All right. Better? Okay. So we learn that in our relationship with God, we want to be surrendered to him because God wants all of us. And then last week, we learned from Greg that in our relationship to the world, we need to be separate from the world. We need to have different values than the world does because we're always being shaped. And if it's not being shaped by God, then we're being shaped by the world. So today, we're going to look at the third relationship, which is our relationship to ourselves. And we're going to find that in our relationship to ourselves, we need to have a sober assessment. So we're going to continue looking in Romans 12. If you have your Bibles, you can open it with me or your apps. Romans 12, verse 3 through 8. And Paul continues by saying, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. 
If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Now, what does Paul mean by you need to have a sober judgment? Um, There are two things I want us to notice. First is that in the Greek, the word that Paul uses uh, that we've translated think, 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 and sober judgment are actually all stemming from the same root word. And um, I like the way that William Newell puts it in his commentary on Romans. Instead of using the word think, Newell uses the word estimate. And that's where we get our word um, judgment, to judge. Okay, so here's how Newell wrote. For I say through the grace, the apostolic grace that was given to me, to everyone that is among you, not to be estimating himself beyond what he ought to estimate, but to be so estimating himself as to have a sober estimate. So as you can see, Paul wants you to think and think about yourself as you are assessing yourself. Second, to fully understand what sober judgment is, we need to understand what the opposite of sober judgment would look like, or impaired judgment. Okay, so we're going to contrast impaired with sober. So I'm sure none of you have ever been impaired before, but for somebody who's impaired with whether it's too much alcohol or drugs or lack of sleep, um, you know that when you're impaired, your vision and your thinking are very unclear. It's, it feels like you're not in your right mind. And basically you're not because another chemical or something else has taken over your body. And so when you're impaired, it's like you're out of your mind. But when you're sober, you're in your right mind. Also, you have distorted thinking and erroneous thinking. Erroneous is just a fancy word for wrong, right? And as a result of that, your judgment is usually going to be very foolish, and you end up doing foolish things. That's what happens when we're impaired. When we're in contrast, then, sober thinking is being in your right mind, which results in clear, wise, accurate decisions and judgment. So, To be sober in our mind and our judgment, then, is to be clear, to be wise and accurate. Notice that in the previous verse in Romans Romans 12, which Greg taught on last week, Paul had just commanded his readers, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. It is logical then to conclude that impaired judgment comes from the pattern of the world. Uh, Greg talked last week about this age. This age is the age in which we are under Satan's rule. But we are also in the not yet age, which is Christ's rule. And if you have come under Christ's rule, then your mind is renewed and your assessment will be sober because it's shaped by God and his values. So, what does it mean to have sober judgment? Well, let's see how Paul say, says that it looks like in, in each of us. In verse 3, Paul says that impaired judgment results in seeing yourself and thinking of yourself more highly or better than other people. Isn't it usually the case that when somebody is drunk or high or otherwise impaired, that they start to think that they can do things that they really can't, like singing or 
driving through walls or flying, okay? You get this impaired idea of who you really are and what you're capable of. Um, I imagine, though, that some of you can't really relate to that. But interestingly enough, the Apostle Paul wrote in verse 3, I say to every one of you, every one of you, that means you and me, which means that Paul is pretty sure that each of us is going to struggle with impaired vision and thinking. Uh, Paul understood something about us. He understood that in human nature, whenever you have two or three people together, inevitably we're going to start noticing how different we are from each other. And when we start noticing, we're going to start comparing. In addition, Paul knew that among believers of Jesus, God was going to give gifts to each one of us. And if we were still living by the world standards, we would start judging each other's gifts. And we would start comparing. And we would start to wonder if my gift is better than or less than or worse than your gift. So Paul knew that in focusing on the differences and comparing, inevitably, most of us would be prideful and we would start to think that we are better than others. We would have selfish ambition, wanting to be better than others. We would have envy, wishing that we had what somebody else had, and we would compete with each other. And Paul knew that this would start happening in the church. James, the writer of the book of James, who's also the brother of Jesus, by the way, James knew this too, and he wrote... If you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. So, when we come together and we start assessing each other by looking around and comparing how different we are from each other, we are basically thinking and believing that different means better than or worse than. There tends to be this constant looking and focusing on what other people have compared to what I have or don't have. And isn't it the case that you can always find somebody who has something worse than you do or something less than you do? And then you think, okay, well, at least I'm better than that person. And somehow doing that makes us feel better about ourselves because we think that different means better or worse than me. But as James 4 tells us, doing this results in disorder and division. So, how then am I supposed to assess myself? What does it look like to have a sober assessment? The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, decides to use this metaphor of the body, the human body, to help us understand what we are like and how we should assess ourselves. In Romans 12, 4 through 5, which we read earlier, Paul said, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So sober assessment will come from understanding how the body works. Okay, so everybody just appropriately touch your body somewhere, okay? So that you're in touch with the body. So here are some things that we can see from looking at this metaphor of the body. First of all, there's just one body, okay? One body, but many different parts. And 
all the different parts together make up one body. In addition, each part has a different function. The hand does something different than the foot, okay? Each part works together or in conjunction with the other parts. And each part belongs to the other because the hand cannot just float by itself. It actually belongs to the arm, okay? Which belongs to the rest of the body. Each part is needed and therefore, I think you would agree that each part of your body is very important, right? So Paul says, if we see ourselves that way, that we are part of the body, then in the human body, differences means that diversity in unity. Differences equal diversity in unity. Diverse parts, different parts, different functions, working together in unity. So as you assess yourself, you can see that you and I are very different from each other. And Paul's going to tell us that you and I have different gifts. We are different from each other. But different does not mean less than or better than. Okay? Different does not mean less than or better than. Different, but equally needed and equally important. And Paul goes on to illustrate what that looks like in the church. What does it mean that I might be the hand and you might be the foot? In Romans 12, 6 to 8, then Paul tells us, he says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your gift. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Paul is saying that each and every one of you has a gift that God has given to you. That means you have a gift, the person next to you has a gift, and I have a gift. And one of the things that you can do in having a sober assessment of yourself is to clearly identify your gifts. Because some of you might be like, well, I, I'm not doing anything because I don't know what I can do. So we have a little handy thing to help you. Um, all of you should have a card that says coming to grips with the real you. If you can take it out, it was on your seat. If you don't have it, look around you at an empty seat there. So to help you in the process of self-assessment, on the back of this card, there's, there's blank spaces for you to fill out your top three strengths and your top three weaknesses. Okay, why are we asking for your weaknesses? Because some of you might be doing something that you're not very good at. That's why you're, you're tired of doing it or you, you're not very effective in it. So it's equally important to know what you're not good at. But looking at your weaknesses also helps you to see that, you know what? There's a reason why I need Greg, because I'm a horrible cook and I would starve. So I like his gift. <laughs> Okay? You need each other because you have weaknesses too. Okay? So you want to acknowledge and understand your weaknesses as well as your strengths. And then we want to focus and, and find a place to use your strength. So sometime this week, after you filled out the card, meet up with a friend or maybe it's your spouse and share your lists with them. Let them know what you're seeing in yourself. So Paul, in this chapter 12, gives us a list of seven gifts. In other places in the New Testament, Paul gives other lists uh, with, with some of the same gifts, but also adding other ones. 
So don't worry about your top three, whether they fall in his list of seven or not. The more important thing is to, to be able to identify what you're good at. But in fact, we could do a whole sermon series on what are commonly called the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and I think at some point we will, to help you understand uh, these things that the Holy Spirit gives to us. But here, in chapter 12, I don't think Paul was giving you this list to say, okay, there are only seven gifts, and you have to have one of these. Notice that Paul's use of the, the list is actually to tell you If you have this, then use it. If this, then use it. So he could have listed 20 other things, and his point would still be, if you've got it, use it. Um, I think that Paul was actually the first person to coin this slogan, and then later on, centuries later, Nike used it, And Shia LaBeouf did too. As you can see, Paul said, just do it. If you have the gift, just do it. Okay? It doesn't get much simpler than that. If your gift is prophesying, just do it. If your gift is teaching, just do it. Okay? Do you get that point? Why did he need to tell us that we need to use our gifts? Why does he say, just do it? I think there are a lot of reasons. But when we have an impaired assessment of ourselves and our gifts, some of us might end up doing nothing. Some of us don't know our gifts. Some of us are too busy being jealous or envious of somebody else's gift so that we don't use ours. Or some of us like our gift a little too much and don't think you all deserve for me to use my gift for you. I don't know what your reason is, but if you're not just doing it, you need to. Because there's this common statistic known as the 2080 rule of church life. The 2080 rule says 20% of the people do 80% of the work. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And if you ask pastors and church leaders, most of them would tell you, yep, in my congregation, that's what it looks like. For whatever reason, too many believers don't understand how much they are needed. They might need what others have to give, but they either can't or won't give to others what the other people need from them. So, where are you in this sober assessment? Where are you? The Apostle Paul says that if you truly have a sober assessment of yourself, you would come to grips with the real you. And the real you is this. You are created uniquely by God. You are gifted specifically by God to contribute to the work of the church. And you are needed by other people. And you need other people. If you know who you really are, you cannot have an inaccurately high estimation of yourself. If you know all these things about yourself, you would have a sober, accurate judgment of yourself. However, there is one final thing that you need to assess. One final thing. And Pastor Colin Smith, if any of you listen to him on the radio, in one of his sermons on Romans 12, this passage, he says that it's not enough to have a gift, to know what it is, and then to use it. Each person must use their gift in accordance with their faith. In accordance with their faith. That's what Paul said. And then Pastor Collins explained that the key to your usefulness to God lies not so much in your gifts, 
as in the faith which with, with which you use your gifts. Okay? So it's in the faith with which you use your gifts. So part of having a sober assessment is to assess where, what is my level of faith? Pastor Collins then made this profound declaration. He said, the need of the church is not more gifts. It's more faith. The need of the church is not that we don't have enough gifts because God has already said, I've given all of you a gift. Some of us even have two or three. So it's not that we're not full of gifts. It's that we've got 80% of the people not having enough faith to exercise their gift. Are you afraid to use your gift? Then ask God to give you more faith so you won't be afraid. Do you think your gift is not important? Then ask God to give you more faith to believe that what he has given you is very important. Are you tired from using your gifts in your own power and it's not very effective? Then have faith in God rather than in the gift that he's given to you. So take some time this coming week to do a sober self-assessment. When you share your top three strengths and weaknesses with a close friend or a spouse, also share with them practical ways that you will move out in faith to exercise or use those gifts. It may be appropriate, too, for you to ask God to give you more faith so that you can and will use your gifts. So have a sober assessment of yourself. That's the kind of relationship you're supposed to have with yourself. See yourself clearly. Understand what God has given to you and understand how important you are to the body of Christ. Let's close in prayer. God, thank you that you saw that it's not good for us to be alone, and you created community, whether that's in our families, whether that's in our friendships, or whether that's in the community of believers that we call church. And Lord, here at River Life, you have brought many of us to this body. And Lord, we want to have a sober assessment of the gifts that you've given to each of us. And we want to have the faith to use those gifts wisely and by your power. So, Lord, I pray for each person here, wherever they belong in their, in their fellowships, Lord, that they would have a sober assessment and know that they are uniquely created by you, specifically gifted by you, and they are important to other people. So I thank you and I bless everyone here in your name, Jesus. Amen.